This week we'll be talking about Baker chapter 10, and we will also be incorporating the Garcia readings from the online e-reserves resource I posted on our WT class website. The focus for this week will be discussing the types of bilingual education. First, let's quickly review the concepts that we've discussed in prior classes. So bilingual education is broken up into two different types of programs, additive versus subtractive bilingual programs. Additive programs have students maintain and continue to practice their first language. And the idea is that students will become proficient in that first language and they will also add a second language, which is the target language they learn. In general, the target language is the majority language of the country they live in. A subtractive program, on the other hand, is the opposite. So the target language or the second language replaces the native language. In the case of the United States, it would be English replacing students' native language, whether it be Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Arabic, etc. And with subtractive policies, the native language deteriorates and there is a likelihood that it could even be lost. And so since the net amount of language is decreasing, it is considered subtractive. So even though a person might develop their second language, their first language is being reduced. So because their first language, their native language is being reduced, we call it subtractive. Let's talk about first the additive bilingual programs. So in these programs, students are not only maintaining their native language, but they're also gaining a second language. First, we'll start with maintenance bilingual programs. So in maintenance bilingual programs, the students enter with, an, with their native language, and then they learn the majority language while also still maintaining their native language, their heritage language. These are often supported by the local community and so, or the local language community as well. And that means that both of those groups often have political agency or voice. So in these situations, the local educational system is supporting the native language of the students. Often these types of schools encourage a strong bicultural identity for students. So students become not only a member of their native culture that they've learned at home, but also they develop the culture in the majority language that they're learning in school. Furthermore, students develop communicative abilities and academic language abilities in both their heritage language and their majority language. So not only will they be able to communicate in casual conversations in their native language, but they're also going to be taught the academic functions of their language, the CALPs, as we've talked about in other chapters. So the academic vocabulary, the academic semantics and language structure used in academic um, literature and texts. And so students will develop that so that they'll become fully proficient academically in both, once again, their native language and the majority language. Some examples of this would be in certain Native American communities. They have control over their local tribal educational system, and so they encourage a maintenance bilingual program where students come in and their native language that's spoken at home is not only maintained, but it's promoted as one of the academic languages of the school. Another example would be Puerto Rican and Dominican communities in New York City, where they have started their own charter schools, or also they have started um, even public schools that encourage students to maintain their culture and their language while also learning English. The second kind of additive bilingual program is called a prestigious bilingual program. And normally in these programs, two prestigious languages, so global languages that often have power, are 
taught to students, including one of them being their majority language. And so often students are separated based on the teacher. So one teacher might be speaking in one language for one subject, and then another teacher might be a, a different subject who teaches in a different language. Often it's compartmentalized. So languages are often taught in particular classrooms. They're not taught in conjunction or together. There's not a lot of language mixing. You maybe will have an English class and you might have a Spanish class, but they won't be a lot of code switching in those classes. Students learn a new language, but often they keep it distinct from their native cultural identity. And so, in general, students develop their first language, the majority language, and then they develop a second global language to be competitive in the global economy or to also have um, socioeconomic opportunities such as travel and culture of other prestigious countries. They're often funded outside the state spectrum, so they're often private schools. And so there, some examples could be like elite English and French schools in Latin America. And these would be where students learn not only Spanish, their native language, but also in school they're expected to learn either French or to learn English. And then the general goal is that students will probably study in the university setting either in the United States, France, or in Europe. And so these prestigious schools are to prepare students to be international students at some of the elite universities in other countries. And many of the families feel that because those students gain that prestigious language, they'll be eligible and effective as international students. And because they are receiving that international degree, they will have more economic opportunities if they want to come back into the country and work for a uh, international company, a transnational company, or if they want to work abroad in the United States or Europe. A third type of additive bilingual program is called the immersion bilingual programs. And this once again has the majority language group opting into having bilingual education, choosing to be part of the bilingual education in hopes that they, they will gain a globally competitive language that they could use in their future jobs and in future um, foreign policy negotiations or future sociocultural interactions. And so the language majority group will receive instruction in the target language and this could in entail like foreign language instruction but normally the foreign language instruction and the target language is only during class time. So students are not speaking a lot of the target language outside of class. Their goal is that because these majority language speakers are learning a second language, that they will also have support in their native language. So the majority language is often valued as well. Students can still communicate to the teacher in the majority language, especially in the beginning when they're developing their new second language abilities. And the majority language is respected. Also, most students enter with about the same amount of background knowledge. And so many of them have had some exposure to their target language at home, maybe through media or watching uh, movies, once again, media, or maybe perhaps through um, other private daycares experiences where they learned a second language. And so an example might be in the United States where you have some people that participate in Spanish daycare schools, and often it's um, people from affluent backgrounds that want their children to become bilingual and to be uh, internationally competitive. And so they place their student, their children in those daycare schools and those children learn a second language at an early age. Yet when they get home, those children go back to speaking the majority language English with their parents.
There are two types of immersion bilingual programs. The first type is called the early immersion bilingual education programs. And those would be kind of like that, those Spanish day school um, centers that I discussed in the last slide. So these would be students who may be in preschool or in elementary school are exposed to a second language at an early age. Still though, these students who often come from um, well-to-do backgrounds or affluent backgrounds will learn their first will learn literacy in their first language because the parents do not want the children to fall behind in the U.S. school system, for example. So they'll still want their children to become fully proficient and even maybe above grade level in the majority language in our country, English. But at the same time, the parents hope that children will maintain some of the skills they learned in their second language so that they can keep on building that second language and eventually become fluent in that second language. The second type is the late immersion bilingual education program. And so the late immersion bilingual education program would have students learning primarily in their native language in the earlier grades, the elementary grades, and then later in junior high and high school, they have more and more classes that are in their second language. And so this could be seen maybe in like an international school, both in the United States and in, um, across the world, where students would learn first their, the majority language, their native language at home and also in elementary school, but then in junior high and high school, they're having several classes in their target language and the goal of the target language is to develop that a global language that is popular in many parts of the world so that students can have advantages when they choose to work in the international economy. Maybe they could work for um, transnational businesses or international companies, or also they could, it would help them when they are traveling or also when they are, if they choose to work in foreign policy. So in all of these school systems, it's normally people who have means, economic means, and their native language is not in danger because those people are the speakers of the majority language. So their majority language is going to be preserved, but also they're learning on their own, they're choosing to learn, they're electing to learn a second language. So it's a form of elective bilingualism. In the immersion revitalization bilingual programs, the goal of these programs are to revitalize a native language that has been at risk of or in danger of being extinct. And so many times these programs teach communities or work with communities that have a history of being colonized and having their language suppressed by a colonial force. And so the goal of these is to provide a reverse language shift. It's to reverse the language shifts of colonialism that focused on students learning the colonial language and having Instead, the children learn the native language. And these programs are also heteroglossic in nature in that the students could come in from all different types of language backgrounds. Many of the students even come in from being primarily speakers of the majority language and having very little background knowledge of their heritage language. And in the school setting, the students are being immersed in their heritage language so that those children can learn that heritage language and transmit that language to their, ch to their children. And so that that language will, will be preserved and continue. And so these programs focus on reclaiming the native language while also incorporating local traditional knowledge into the curriculum. An example might be the Maori in New Zealand or Native American communities in the Southwest. So let's focus with the Maori 
in New Zealand, for example. New Zealand was colonized by the British, and so the, when the British came in, they suppressed the Maori language, and almost all people were forced to speak English instead of Maori. And so very few people started having a strong proficiency in Maori, especially not academic proficiency. And so there was a fear that Maori would be eventually an endangered or extinct language. But instead, uh, when New Zealand became its own country, and in recent years with um, recent indigenous rights movements, New Zealand now made Maori one of the native languages of New Zealand. And so now, students who live in Maori communities are learning Maori, even if they did not know Maori at home, even if they were speaking English at home, they are being taught Maori in the schools so that they will be able to become fully proficient in Maori and pass that language to their children. Meanwhile, those students are also being taught in English for part of the day so that they can communicate in the majority language of New Zealand as well. A fifth type of additive bilingual program is, are called developmental bilingual programs. These are geared toward language minority population whose native language is not threatened. So an example might be in the United States, a developmental bilingual program for native Spanish speakers. And so the native Spanish speakers are learning their native language, even though there's not a risk that the entire Spanish language will go extinct if these students do not learn it. Rather, the parents and the community still want their children to learn it, not because they're worried the language will go extinct, but rather that they want to still have their children speak their native language and to understand their native culture. Often these types of programs receive state support, so they're often public schools. Deaf education would be a type of this developmental bilingual program because students first learn and become proficient in their native language, sign language, and then they learn especially literacy and often sometimes oral hearing language in their second language, the majority language. So in the United States, that would be English. So in the United States, this would look like a situation in which English language learners first develop proficiency in their first language. They learn literacy primarily first through their first language. They remain in bilingual classes and they continue to receive instruction in their first language until at least the end of sixth grade. And so for most of their time, they're having at least 40% of their instructional time in their native language. And then maybe the other 60% of the time can be in English. A sixth type of additive bilingual program is called two-way dual language programs. And these are becoming more and more popular. These are also heteroglossic in nature in the sense that students come in at various levels based on their home environment. In these programs, there's a mixture of students of various bilingual language levels. And so also you'll have students of various language backgrounds. In general, they have about half the class that is from, is, that are native speakers of a minority language. And then you have the other half of the class that are, that are native speakers of the dominant majority language. In general, this method has students who have different language backgrounds and different proficiency levels supporting each other, and it emphasizes mutual learning. So students cannot really rely on, on only their native language because half of the instructional time will be in their second language. And so there's a there's no necessarily any big large preference for one language over the other and so students feel obligated to learn both for example some days might be english days and then the other days might be spanish days and so students who are native english speakers 
will feel more comfortable perhaps on the English days, but then they'll also learn to become, pop become comfortable and proficient during those Spanish days because they'll be having that throughout their elementary school career and hopefully up until high school. Moreover, the benefit of these programs is that they promote cross-cultural respect. And so an example, once again, would be two-way 50-50 dual language programs where you have an equal mixture of native speakers who speak the minority language, so maybe Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic, or Vietnamese, and then the other 50% of students would be native speakers of English. And furthermore, like we've discussed before, there'd be equal instructional time spent in both languages. And so often that time is broken up by days or by weeks. So maybe you might have uh, Monday, Tuesday, and half of Wednesday as English days, and then uh, after the afternoon of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as Spanish days. Or maybe you might have one week of English and one week of Spanish. And they've done research and they've shown that this model is the most effective for English language learners. English language learners have the highest proficiency of English and native language proficiency in this model. And they compared this model to both bilingual programs in which students transition into all English instruction at, at an early age, and they also compared these to students who have only learned English their whole time. So English language learners who were in these programs had the most English knowledge, even though other students had, had received all English instruction their, their whole educational career. Furthermore, this, this method is very popular also with majority language speaking families because their children get to be develop a second language and become bilingual, which is, as we've mentioned in earlier chapters, more and more beneficial in terms of the world economy, foreign relations, and in travel and leisure. Also, we've discussed there's cognitive benefits of developing bilingualism, and so parents want their students to have those cognitive benefits as well. Next, we have bilingual content-based language learning, which is another type of additive bilingual pro program. And these programs, students are always taught one or two subjects in the target language. So for example, maybe they're always taught since elementary school in um, English for social studies, even though maybe their native language is French. So maybe a school in France teaches all of their students um, English from the beginning and when they teach English, they also teach social studies content. So in general, social studies is associated with English in that school. In these programs, since there are only one or two subjects, students are not expected to develop native-like proficiency in terms of accent and vocabulary. But still, students benefit in these programs from having some proficiency in the target language. And so they, they in general, will be able to understand, for example, and have pretty high listening abilities in the target language, even if they are not fluent speakers in the target language, if they need to use that target language, they can have um, at least some communicative abilities. In these programs, they're normally at the national level or at the school-wide level even, so st all students are going to participate. It's not based on whatever native language they had at home. It's just based on there's going to be a majority language that is taught mostly in school, and then there's going to be a target language that is often a global language, such as English, Spanish, French, German, Mandarin. And students will learn that global language for one or two periods of the day. So this is often taught in European countries. So, for example, a school maybe in England might teach most of the day in English, but then they might have two or three classes that are devoted just to French. So maybe they might have a French language class. They might also have 
another maybe French social studies class or a French science class, but they have at least one or two classes that are entirely in French. And the goal is that students have some communicative ability, especially receptive ability, listening and reading in the target language. The eighth type of additive bilingual program is called multiple multilingual education. And students are not just learning a second language, but they're learning three languages, or at least three. They could have more. Often the languages are interwoven in instruction, so there's sometimes not always a lot of patterns in terms of they don't always have a breakdown of 33% one language, 33% the second language, 33% the third language. Often that's not the case. Often it's, it's interwoven within the instruction kind of in a slightly haphazard way. And so this, this plan and this method of language development is still um, in the process. So it's also very common in certain countries that might have three languages. They might have two official languages and then a tribal language. So an example might be in India or maybe South Africa where there might be two official languages that are very popular, but then students also know their regional dialect, which they speak at home with their parents. And so the teachers who know the regional dialect will communicate with students in, in all three languages. Maybe they might use the regional dialect when they're talking about informal communication or they have, they're maybe um, just talking about like social concepts, but they might use English, for example, the, one of the majority language, excuse me, not one of the majority, one of the official languages to talk about math and then they might use hindi another major uh well another official language to maybe talk about government or history and so it's not always um broken down based on subject but that's just an example these are also becoming somewhat popular in the united states for example in the dallas area they have this i believe it's called the international leadership charter schools and their focus is on developing students' abilities in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. And many of the students that join that charter school have are already bilingual. They've they've um, they were maybe native Spanish speakers, and then they learned English in elementary school, and then now in the junior high and high school setting, they're continuing to study both languages, and hopefully, they're going to add on proficiency in Mandarin as well. And that's their goal, that's their model. And so this would be a multiple multilingual educational program because students are not learning just one or two languages, they're learning three. Now let's move on to subtractive bilingual programs. So as we've discussed before, subtractive bilingual programs are unfortunately overemphasizing the majority language, the target language, and students could lose their first language, their native language, because of, there's so much emphasis on students learning the target language, the majority language of the country. The first type is called mainstreaming or submersion. So this, is, this would be when on language minority students are placed in monolingual English classes or monolingual majority language classes. And so those students do not have any access or any use of their native language. They're only taught in the majority language. And they're often, and they're working alongside students who, who are native speakers of the majority language. And so one critique of this is the sink, it's the sink or swim approach. So students are expected to either adapt and adjust or they fail and one of the sad things would be they might drop out or they might be retained. And so that's one of the critiques on this system. So in the United States, it would look like where an English language learner would be placed in all English classes and they would be taught only in English. And then their peers in their classroom, their fellow students, would probably be a mixture of either ELL students 
or native English speakers. And so the ELL students would be expected to understand the content that's pr presented to them all in English. And they would ELL students would be expected to respond to their teachers in English as well. I skipped ahead a little bit on the last slide, but I just wanted to explain once again why that's subtractive. So the submersion pro English program or submersion language program is subtractive because students are only taught academically in the majority language. And so often since they've received so much instruction in the majority language and many of their peers are native speakers of the majority language, students might lose their native language. They might lose their ability to communicate in the native language and they will certainly not develop academic abilities, especially reading and writing abilities in their native language. And so I've heard from other families discussions of how, unfortunately, when their student was placed in these programs, they ended up leaving the programs without, with little knowledge of their native language. They basically only spoke English and they had forgotten, let's say, their native language of Spanish or Vietnamese. And so the parents spoke the native language, but the children spoke only English, and so there was somewhat of a disconnect between the two groups. Now let's talk a little bit about the second type, structured immersion. So structured immersion is slightly different than the submersion method that we talked about, but it is still subtractive. The end result is that English language learners are very likely to not have full proficiency in their native language. And they're most likely not going to have academic proficiency in their native language because they're not learning academic language in their native language. They're only learning the academic language in the second language, the majority language. In these types of programs, only language minority children would be in the class. And the instruction is only in the majority language though. So for example, in the United States, these might be like ESL pullout or sheltered English classes where all the students are English language learners, but all of the instruction is in English. And the teacher is most likely a monolingual English teacher. In these programs, they try to accommodate the English language learners by providing instruction in English with a simpler form of the language. So they might use texts that are written at a a lower grade level than the students are actually in. So for example, if they're in that program and they're in third grade, they might be reading English texts that are in first and second grade so that the language is more accessible for those students. Also in these programs, teachers are slightly more likely to accept communication in the native language, but still, once again, the end goal is that the students are learning the majority language. So in the United States, the English language learners are expected after within maybe a year or two in the program to only be speaking and communicating in English. In terms of ESL programs, the structured immersion program has both benefits and downsides. So some benefits include that since the entire class is made up of English language learners. English language learners who are learning their second language, English, will feel less stress since they're not having to compete with native English speakers. They're, more at a, they're at a more even or equivalent playing field to their fellow students because all students are also learning English as their second language. A second benefit is that teachers who are teaching these programs can devote more time and sensitivity to their students' specific linguistic, cultural, and educational needs since the teacher knows that all of these students are English language learners. The teacher does not have to differentiate between English language learners and native English speakers. Instead, they can just focus on helping the English language learners who are the only students in the classroom. A third 
reason why there is a benefit to the structured immersion program compared to the submersion ESL program is that students have some form of collective identity and they have mutual support. Since many of them are learning English and often many of them come from the same native language or the same um, native country, or their parents came from the same native country, many of the students have similar identities and they can support each other and connect with each other in that way. The, there are some downsides with the Structured Immersion Program. So with the Structured Immersion ESL Program, one downside is that there could be social isolation or stigmatization. Often when the ESL students or, or English language learners are pulled out of the classroom, many times people will start to view the English language learners subconsciously as inferior, or the teacher might also be focused on only giving lower level materials to students who are English language learners. And English language learners will not develop those cognitive abilities, those higher order thinking skills that they would have developed in a mixed level or mixed language classroom. Furthermore, there would be a lack of role models of native, native speakers. So students learn a lot from their peers and from peer interaction. But if all of their peers are speaking at a low level of language, at a very beginning level of English, then it's very hard to have academic discussions and to have higher order thinking activities and having beneficial communication where students can learn from each other. As we've talked about in class, mixed ability grouping has been shown by research to be beneficial to students because students of high abilities can relearn the information while teaching it to other people. And then students with low, from low abilities benefit from hearing the information from their peers. And so often mixed ability grouping is the ideal type of situation. But once again, there is a difficulty with the structured immersion program because all students often come in at a same language background of, um, they especially enter those programs as beginners in the native language. And so they don't, they aren't able to learn from their native English speaking peers, correct pronunciation and correct um, language structure. Let's talk about a third subtractive ESL program type. It is called content-based ESL programs. In content-based ESL programs, students learn the content areas like math, science, social studies, and reading. And they also learn those content knowledge skills along with language skills. So students are learning their second language English in the United States while they're also learning content. So unlike the other models where students would first focus primarily on developing language skills in English or be isolated from the native English speaking population until students are, are somewhat proficient in English, instead in, the, in this third type, the content-based ESL program, students are encouraged to learn content knowledge while they're learning English so that students hopefully will fall, will not fall as far behind as others could be compared to their age level counterparts. An example of this in the United States would be the PSYOP model. And so the PSYOP model could be both with sheltered English classes where there's only ELL students, or it could also be in an immersion-based class where there's a mixture of native English speakers and English language learners. Often with these types of content-based ESL programs, the teacher has an ESL certification or has been trained in specific ESL methods such as the PSYOP model. And in these programs, the teacher differentiates the language used in the classroom to the English language learners 
based on the English proficiency level of the students. So if the teacher knows that most students are speaking at a beginner's uh, level or have a beginner's listening comprehension level, then the teacher will probably slow down the pace of their instruction and enunciate words more clearly while also providing English language learner scaffolds to the English language learners. And so some of the scaffolds that the teachers will provide that help students learn content knowledge while also helping them stay at the same content level as their peers are the following. So sometimes teachers will provide simplified language to the English language learners, or they might provide leveled readers. So they might have English language learners that are reading at a lower reading level than the native English speakers. And so they'll, the teacher will still provide the same content subject. Maybe they'll both be reading about the solar system or about energy, but the English language learners will re receive a reading book that has slightly simplified vocabulary and less abstract language and maybe more visuals and in-text definitions. Another scaffold, speaking of visuals, is actually providing visuals or providing gestures or realia, like real objects. And these are useful contextual supports for English language learners because it can help them understand the meaning of unknown words or unknown sentences or more complicated or complex uh, sentences because they have those visuals, they have those gestures and those real objects to connect to. As we've talked about, teachers often will adjust their speaking style and speaking speed and enunciation so that they have clear language input for their English language learners. And so English language learners can comprehensively understand what the would be graphic organizers or organization aids. So these are useful visual tools as well that help um, English language learners organize information based on topic area. And it can help in the comprehension of text. Another type is pre-teaching of vocabulary where students are taught um, the difficult vocabulary words that they might not have heard in the beginning of the lesson so that when they see it during the actual lesson where they're being taught the new information, that new information is much more accessible because the students are not being, are not worried about the new vocabulary terms. They've already seen them before. Further scaffolds include hands-on or kinesthetic learning with like manipulatives or um, once again, real objects. And this method also encourages the English language learners to have frequent practice and frequent collaboration and communication, including interaction with both their peers and their teacher. So just to summarize once again, the content-based ESL programs are taught all in English, but they provide content support and English language learner scaffolds to students. And often the teacher is certified in those methods. It's still subtractive, however, like um, just like submersion, all English, no supports, and just like sheltered English, ESL pullout, content-based ESL programs are subtractive in nature because students are emphasized or encouraged to learn the target language. So English language learners in the United States are only taught in English primarily. And so when they're only taught in English and they only develop academic abilities and academic vocabulary in English, eventually their use of their second language deteriorates and their academic knowledge of their second language is never developed. So students are most likely going to only have minimal abilities in their native language, but they'll learn fully their second language, the target language, English. As we have just discussed, 
There are three subtractive ESL programs, the submersion or immersion approach, the sheltered approach, and the content-based approach. In each of these approaches, they, it is considered that they are subtractive programs because the end goal is that students will develop proficiency in the majority language English. And they are, students are not being taught to develop academic proficiency in their native language or even to practice their native language in the school setting, which could lead to even a complete loss of their native language. Now we're going to discuss what research says about those three programs, especially compared to bilingual programs that are additive. So research shows that in these types of classes, ELL students mostly interact with each other and the teacher. They often do not interact with native English speakers. Also in sheltered English classes, ELL students do not have the language abilities to answer higher order critical thinking questions or tasks. And since the entire class is made of those English language learners, often the class and the activities that are taught to the students stay at a very low level of rigor. And so students are often not being taught critical thinking skills or higher order thinking skills, and they're not being asked to, for example, assess, apply, evaluate, or create new products. Instead, they're mostly staying at the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy or the lower levels of thinking. So they're mostly asked only to remember things or to describe things, not to explain why they occur. Many times also in research, they have shown that students often get frustrated in these types of programs. They become academically unsuccessful and they're more likely to drop out. Often students feel more that their home language, their culture, and their identity is being rejected and they could feel alienated from the general class and the general educational environment, according to research studies. Furthermore, the first couple months of schooling Often for these language minority students, they feel confused and they don't know what the teacher is saying. So in the United States, English language learners for several months might be totally confused of what their teacher is saying and they've lost several months of content knowledge. Moreover, teachers who serve English language learners often do not have the adequate training to effectively differentiate their instruction to English language learners. Another issue is that it's difficult for teachers to communicate with parents when the parents speak primarily the minority language. Mencken, an educational researcher, found that even after seven years of instruction in English, in all English, English language learners who began high school began with a limited academic literacy in English. So they had very limited CALP or academic vocabulary and academic semantics and understanding of the language. Because they had come in with such limited academic literacy, it was found that English language learners did not have sufficient ability in their second language, English, to acquire the high school content. And apart from that, since the English language learners had not been taught their native language, they didn't have their native language abilities either. So even if the content was now taught or given them materials in their native language, they would not understand in their native language because they hadn't used their native language for seven years. And their English abilities were below grade level, so they didn't have access to the curriculum resources at the grade level either because that language, that academic English was difficult for them to understand. 
There's a fourth type of subtractive program, and it's called a transitional bilingual program. Even though it's called bilingual, it's still subtractive because the end goal is that students will transition from their native language to the majority language. So in the United States, this would look like maybe the students start pre-K or kindergarten learning a, a significant amount of time in Spanish, their native language, but then it quickly transitions into students learning all English after only a couple of years. Sometimes this program is separated by subject. So in my district, the, the subjects of math and science were always taught in English, but the subjects of language arts and Spanish and social studies was primarily taught in Spanish for pre-K, kindergarten, first, grade and even second grade but then starting in third grade it was about uh, it was a majority of the class was of the instructional time was in English because math and science had always been taught in English so those continued to be taught in English and then the language arts and social studies were taught about half of the time in Spanish and half the time in English so in the end 75 percent more or less of the instructional time was in English and 25% was in Spanish in third grade. And it eventually got lower and lower as the grades went on. And so this was a type of transitional bilingual program. There are two types of transi transitional bilingual programs, early exit and late exit. So early exit would be where the goal is for students to transfer out of the bilingual program after three years. And so the goal is that by after three years, students are almost predominantly only speaking English in the classroom. And, and so if they started school in pre-K, by second or third grade, they're mostly speaking only English. And this is actually a program that has been, that I've seen in um, the Amarillo ISD. When I talked to an Amarillo ISD bilingual teacher, she said in her school, that starting in the second semester of second grade, it's almost all English. And so this would be kind of like in between an early exit program and a late exit transitional bilingual program. So a late exit um, bilingual program would be where students receive about 40% of the instruction in their native language, and then 60% of the instruction is in the majority language. And they keep that up for at least five years and they stay in bilingual education for five years, or they could stay the entire elementary time in bilingual classes. It's just the level of English increases. The amount of instructional time in English increases from 60% to maybe 70%, 80%, 90%, 100 100%, especially in the later elementary school years, like maybe fourth grade, for example, it's 70% English, fifth grade, 80% English, 6th grade, 90% English, and then in 7th grade, they're expected to do all English, for example. That would be still a late exit program because students are in the bilingual program for five years or more, and they are receiving some instructional support and at least some instructional time in their native language. So transitional bilingual programs have advantages to other subtractive programs. They are relatively more effective than submersion. They're more effective than other monolingual ESL programs like the sheltered English or the content-based English. And the reason why that they're slightly more effective than those all English approaches is that it's a, they provide a temporary refuge in which the native language and culture are valued for a part of the time that the student's initial career as a student. Also, there's less of an extreme culture shock since the beginning years, the students often have native language support. However, it's still subtractive in nature. So the goal is to transition from the minority language, the home language, to the majority language. And by doing that, those kinds of programs emphasize uh, 
subconsciously that there's a superiority of the majority language. And bilingualism is only supposed to be emphasized or taught as a temporary measure. These programs also further, transitional bilingual programs also further support the idea of social and cultural assimilation so that students will eventually be dominant in the majority language and identify more with the majority culture rather than maintaining both their native language and being proficient in the majority language and maintaining both their native culture and their bicultural identity of also the majority language culture. I just also want to explain what the early exit would look like in the United States. So in these situations, in these types of schools that have the early exit transitional bilingual program, as soon as possible, usually second or third grade, students transition to all English instruction. And this would be even in bilingual classes. So they would be bilingual only in name only. And so by third grade and up, it would be mostly English with Spanish support if needed. So in one of my schools that I worked at, this was the type of program they had. By third grade, almost all students were tested in English. Almost all of the language I spoke in the classroom was English. And the hope was that students would understand it and would be successful. And if I needed to, in small groups, I would provide Spanish support for my students. That was the model they had. Yet when I did my experience as a bilingual teacher was when I taught students difficult concepts in their native language, Spanish, they were much more likely to understand those concepts than when I taught them only in English. So in my opinion, that transitional bilingual program was not effective. It was more beneficial to have a developmental bilingual program where students develop their abilities in both English and Spanish and they have about equal amounts of English and Spanish throughout the school day. And this helps students especially understand um, difficult academic concepts because they could have access both in their native language, Spanish, and then I could also reteach those difficult concepts in English as well. And so students saw those concepts in whichever language they felt more comfortable in. So in these types of transitional bilingual programs, which were the programs I mentioned that were somewhat ineffective in, my ineffective in my experience, the yearly assessment, TELPASS, the English assessment, would test if students were fluent in English. And based on students' results on the TELPASS, those would determine if students would transition to ESL or monolingual classes, where their classmates would be a mixture of both English language learners and native English speaking students. And the goal in these early exit transitional bilingual programs were for students to take the state assessments in English, the STAR test, as soon as possible. And once again, the goal was for students to learn in English, the majority language, as soon as possible even if perhaps they were not ready and they didn't understand everything. The theory was the more English, the better. So even if they didn't understand every single content concept that we were teaching in English, the theory was that, well, the overall benefits would outweigh that. Although, as I explained earlier, I felt like my students learned a lot more content when I taught them the content in both their native language, Spanish, and in English. Also, I felt actually that students learned English a lot more effectively when I taught them to have a very strong uh, language background in their native language, Spanish, and then I gradually introduced more English to them. I felt that when I did start to gradually introduce English, those students learned English at a much faster pace than when I had just taught completely 100% in English. So this is a summary
of the different programs and which ones are additive and which ones are subtractive. So thank you very much. Um, we will do this reflection activity another time. But I just uh, wanted to say thank you again. And we'll, in the next weeks, we'll be discussing in more detail the research that supports that additive bilingual programs, especially the two-way dual language programs, are actually the most effective way for students to learn both their native language and English. So students actually learn more English in those two-way dual language bilingual programs because students can transfer many of their skills, their literacy skills, their print awareness, their phonetic knowledge, their metalinguistic concepts, and um, their syntax and semantic concepts that they've developed in their first language, they can transfer that to their second language, English. So even though they start learning English at maybe a later time than students who have 100% English all the time, the students that do learn English as two-way dual language learners learn English at a much faster rate than someone who was just exposed only to 100% English all the time. Furthermore, those students in two-way dual language programs also are much more likely to obtain grade level content knowledge, which is very important. And so because they can understand all of the content knowledge and input that's been delivered to them by the teacher, since it's delivered both in their native language and then also their second language, English, rather than an all English program where bilingual students, English language learners would only be receiving the content knowledge in their second language, English which they might not be proficient in. They might not understand English when the teacher explains it to them only in English. They might not understand that content. So thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you all in the future.